people who want to criminalize women uh, and not just the doctors, because typically almost no politician that I know of. Right. Is that your language or like Planned Parenthood's language? The criminalization of women. Okay. But But, his argument in 2008, 2012 was safe, legal, and rare. That was incremental. Yeah. And that now is the position of the pro-life movement, right? No. Safe, legal, and rare? Abortion hearts women? I thought that's like on your banners and stuff. You You think the best way to reach an atheist is by not talking to them about God? The video you're about to watch is one that we shot a few months ago at the University of Missouri. Uh, It features myself speaking with a number of students who are affiliated with the University Students for Life of America student group. For those of you who've watched this channel, you know that there is a difference between the pro-life view and the abolitionist view. And sometimes whenever I talk about that on the streets, We see a lot of comments and people going, "Uh, this doesn't seem to be like that big of a difference. Well, you'll see in this video that there are a good many differences between pro-life and abolition. We go through some of them. It's not all of them, but we hope that this video will help clarify some of the distinctions between pro-life and abolition. And honestly, we want a bunch of our viewers to understand that we are not pro-lifers and we're not just saying that to be cute. We really do believe the differences between pro-life and abolition are important, and so we want you to understand them. I do want to give a shout out to this SFLA group who, unlike the Director of Students for Life of America, Kristen Mercer Hawkins, willingly engaged the issue thoughtfully and from an open-minded perspective. And so, kudos to this group. So as you watch this video, Anything that comes up, maybe some kind of question that I'm not answering in the video, go ahead and put it in the comment section. We're going to be really diligent to go through and try to answer as many of those questions that we can. And also it'll help us know what kind of issues are out there for our viewers um, so we maybe can address them in a future video. And for future videos, be sure that you like and subscribe to our channel. Thanks. Kristen Hawkins has like been public about her opposition to abolitionism. Right. What, would, what would you say? Yeah, she like occasionally she'll tweet something and you'll be like, oh wow, only an abolitionist would say that. But then she'll like tweet something the next day, you're like, ah, abortion isn't wrong because it's bad for the environment. And you're like, what in the world? Like students for life will like those bodies are going into the ground and contaminating our water, and you're like, bad argument. Um, but she lead with child murder, that's our strongest. Yeah, I I really yeah. think like i Totally on board with you guys. I really think the reason for that is to try to get the other people who oh, are like, yeah. super like environmental, like crazy, like crazy about the environment. And yeah. Be like, okay, that's wrong. Like, but if you get them with that, you're gonna have to keep them with that. Yeah. And uh, turns out, killing people is probably better for the environment, if, according to people who are obsessed about the environment. So. If the problem ultimately is though a sin problem in their hearts, like they're in rebellion to God then you're going to bring them in, you're trying to bring them in with the environmentalism thing, and then you have to shift, you have to pivot to repentance. Um, and that's not something that's happening. Because um, ultimately it's a, it's a problem yeah. with their heart before God. What's, what are the abolitionist views currently on um, the Republican primary? Is anyone considering the endorsement at this point, based on... Are like abolitionists abolitionist? considering endorsing any Republicans? Yeah, uh, generally... They're, everybody who's running is for abortion at some level. So you have you have the abolitionists who are like, we treat abortion like murder. Yep. It is child sacrifice. It must be abolished. And then you have pro-lifers and pro-choices. They agree on two things. They agree that sometimes abortion is okay, and they agree that mothers should never be prosecuted for the murder of their babies. And those are the options that we have to choose from the primary. So abolitionists yeah. are actually fundamentally opposed to both of those camps and we can't we don't generally get to but the idea is that if we would spread the ideas enough to where it pushes some republican candidate to be more and more abolitionist so like in oklahoma we've actually had a guy run as an abolitionist against an incumbent pro-lifer who had the endorsement of all the pro-life groups all the pro-life legislators the pro-life governor name it he ran as an abolitionist against the pro-lifer so that we could criminalize abortion in Oklahoma, and won. So, 
that's not everywhere, but that's possible in Oklahoma because of the amount of kind of toiling in the ground along those lines. Like right now, you, je you have the Republican Party at large thinking, well, you got like the Trump side that's basically saying, like, we need to stop talking about abortion because that's, that's a losing thing for us. We need to whatever, you know. So Trump, I don't know how y'all feel about him, but, you know, he's definitely, he's definitely, he's, he funded abortion more than any other president in the history of the world. But, uh, but he did, on the other hand, say, I think in his speech announcing running for president that we should execute drug dealers, which... I do like that. <laughs> he also put, just not, just not, just not, but not child murderers. Well, he also put the kind of deciding justices on the court to overturn the row. But that was horrible, though, right? The Dobbs decision? Yeah. Like, isn't that a... It wasn't far enough, but it's... Well, not, not, no, not whether it's far enough. Like, don't look at it like on a spectrum. Like, is it good or is it bad? Do you believe that uh, the right to murder children should be left up to state governments? For them to regulate no, abortion, I like however Clarence they see. Thomas's uh, argument that it um, should be backed under I think it was the 13th, no, it was 14th, the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment, yeah. That, uh, that no state should laws. criminalize abortion. Right. Which, well, if you had, I'm sorry, the first. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you had abolitionists on the Supreme Court instead of pro-lifers, you would have had the repeal of Roe v. Wade and no more abortion in the United States of America. Right, but I'm sure you prefer the Dobbs decision, how it currently stands, over how it was before. Dobbs. No, I think the Dobbs decision is pretty much precisely what I'd write if I wanted to keep abortion from being abolished. Because how you keep it around. So the thousands of babies who have been saved due to the Dobbs decision, you know, that's, that's not at this point. Well, I don't know if that's a yet known thing. It's, it's been proven that there are states that, for, like California and New York, that are like sanctuary for abortion. Sure, sure, sure. Slightly. But if yeah. you look at the overall uh, amount of abortions conducted post uh, the Dobbs decision, it has decreased well, by at least, I think, 2,000 ways. For their projected numbers, those stats can't be possibly in yet. Okay, but, but if that is true, that's but like, significant. I'd say, well, here's, here, maybe or maybe not. To get the way we think about it. Okay. So, Abolitionists are growing in numbers in the culture. You have a bunch of people saying, hey, this is child sacrifice. We should repent of this as a nation. We should abolish it, whatever, and so on and so forth. And they're gaining ground. Well, the problem is, is they're gaining ground that's pro-lifers becoming abolitionists. So this looks really kind of scary. They, they're, they're filing briefs, ambicus briefs, before the uh, Supreme Court saying abortion's murder. It should be abolished, criminalized. Well, what do they do? They're like, well, crap, you've got people like the state of Oklahoma is like threatening to abolish abortion as murder in defiance of the Supreme Court. Well, that's nullification. That's challenging it. That's, oh, what do we do? Well, okay, here's what we have to shift. We need to allow the states to have abortions. And so you allow the states to have abortions. Uh, different states are choosing different things. No state has yet criminalized abortion. You know, you, you have states like Oklahoma and Missouri, we have abortion clinics, but we just order a lot more abortion pills. And that's statistically actually shown to be true. Like, you, you, used, to, you used to get, I don't know how many abortions happen in Missouri a year. What is it? Five to 8,000 or something like that. I'm not sure what it is. Your population's bigger than ours. We have 5,000 abortions a year. We are fourth in the nation in abortion pills ordered. So LifeSite News could do a story and say, hey, Oklahoma doesn't have any abortion mills. That's 5,000 babies saved. You abolitionists are stupid. And I'm like, I ordered abortion pills last week and got them five days later in my mailbox and could take them and no one would know about it. And according to the studies of like the JAMA study, a lot of people ordering abortion pills to Oklahoma. So do I think that 5,000 abortions aren't happening in Oklahoma? No. Because I think people are going to abort their babies in whatever way they're told to abort their babies. So I don't think the numbers have gone down. But in the event that the numbers have gone down, uh, it might be the only way to keep the numbers up. So like say only 800,000 babies were murdered in the year after the pro-life movement succeeded in its goal of repealing Roe v. Wade. Well, they could have had zero legal abortions and criminalized it. So that's what you're comparing. So when you say it saved 10,000 babies, you're, you're comparing saving 10,000 babies to allowing 800,000. Well, 
part of the issue is that um, pre Roe, we didn't have the drug cartel that exists today when it comes to the abortion industry. Um, mm-hmm. as, as, you know, the abortion pill uh, you know, didn't exist, at least yeah. in the at this point. Yeah, it's been kind of perfected um, over the last 50 years of incrementalism. Right. When we're, you know, we're looking at like uh, the numbers of illegal abortions pre Roe. Um, they were largely um, insufficient, insufficient um, especially in comparison to uh, the amount of deaths that were reported, right? Uh, okay. At least from mothers who were dying from these illegal abortions. But now that we have this, you know, outward, you know, pill it, that's being spread on the masses, even if it were to be criminalized, it's going to be difficult to enforce it. At least, you know, without violating people's constitutional yeah. rights when it comes to oh abortion. yeah, it's a m- like that. major problem. Well, you're seeing this major problem uh, reflected with um, testosterone pills when it comes to states that are. Um, making uh, transgender gender, care. yeah, gender affirming care illegal yeah. um, in those states. You're seeing huge problems with yeah. basically drug cartels that are you know, being able to sell those pills there. I, I mean, I hate to be pessimistic about it, but like they drag their feet on treating abortion as murder for so long that by the time they can get rid of surgical abortions, it's when surgical abortions are no longer necessary. Right. I mean, it was already it was already accounting for less than surgical abortions. The, the primary way that abortions happen are chemical abortions. And now you can do a chemical abortion up to like 14 weeks. Yeah. And you can get that in the mail in a week and without talking to anyone. And you don't have to like walk into a clinic. You don't have to see anyone. No one has to know. Um, pro-lifers are going to tell you that if you do it, you were a victim. Um, all that kind of stuff. And so it's like so much stuff has been burnt into the conscience of our culture that now we're kind of in this place like, yeah, I do think there needs to be laws, but the primary, the primary good thing that comes from like an abolition law is you have like the governing authority saying, this is murder. And so like the, you know, 10 year old kids, like this is murder, you know, they're being told by the, the elected officials and the leaders, this is murder, thou shalt not murder. Well, they can still murder and there's not going to be really a way to stop them in a lot of ways because... Like, even if we, even if, say, like, you criminalize pills in the state of Missouri, there are stockpiles on this campus. Yeah. Um, but, like you said, if you're going to go through with an abortion, you'll find some way. Yeah. And, and if anything, you'll, I mean, even if you use a coat hanger, which is totally wrong. It's wrong to kill people. It's wrong to hurt yourself when you're killing people. And killing people shouldn't be safe. But, like, it's just, you can't blame, like, our parents. You know, you can't blame, like, the past 50 years. But in a certain sense... Like, the one thing I think is good about Dobbs is that Dobbs basically admit that all submission to Roe v. Wade for the past 50 years has been unconstitutional and bad. So, every baby aborted in the United States of America has been aborted in compliance with all those pro-life laws. See, part of the issue, I think, is looking at this in a realistic sense, because I'm sure... In a what sense? In a realistic sense, because while I fully agree with you in a moral sense, I fully agree Mm -hmm. with you policy position. I think that the problem is is that it's not an electable position and I think we need to move in a uh, transitionary period back to what we want it to be. Well, what's the evidence for that, though? So, if we look at typically, like, politicians who uh, openly advocate or vote for um, abortion without, or uh, criminalizing abortion without exception. Uh-huh. Now, I'm going to make the... They don't get supports because the pro-life movement has support them. Well, let me make the separation for um, people who want to criminalize women uh, and not just the doctors, because typically almost no politician that I know of um, that s- supports that at this point. But that's the Right. Is that is your language or is like Planned Parenthood's language? Uh, I'm just making a general assumption. Like the, that like the I, criminalization I of women. A, uh, well, I can't think of a politician... Um, that, that supports openly supports criminalizing women. Yeah. So we so like abolition. There are some abolitionists openly support criminalizing the act of abortion. So if the if a man was forcing a woman to get an abortion, he'd be the principal cause of the so she would be protected. The only way to protect her in that is if abortion's murder, and he's the yeah, principal. That's what say you're so it's the we're act. About the uh, women who go into yeah. Planned Parenthoods because they have an abuse abortion. Yeah, like point forces them to do that. Like one percent or whatever it is. You know, for rape and that sort of sense, but when we're talking about like you know women who are sexually abused or um, have abusive you know relationships and that sort of sense, that happens more frequently than than not. I mean, if, uh, if you're factoring in abortion, m- well, more, have a whole other thing, but more frequently than not. More frequently than one percent. 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the 1% is like the rape, 1% or less. Yeah. The forced abortions, I don't know what it is. The problem is, is pro-lifers. Is probably a better way of yeah, coerce or encourage, all that kind of stuff. Because I, I would agree that, yeah, if, you, uh, if men weren't doing that, you would cut down the number of abortions. But you actually can't even stop coercion without criminalizing that. That's why I say it's not criminalizing the woman. That's a straw man. Right. Well, you Criminalize can... the act. Yeah. So whoever's the person that's doing it, that way, because like you know, you can't you can't acquit the guilty, um, which is what pro-life laws do when they say blanket immunity for all women. Right. But you can't also punish the innocent. So in the event that you ha really did have a woman who was coerced, and it was clear, how do you protect her? You punish the person who did it. Right. So that's why it's important to say not criminalize the women. That's that's code for the pro-lifer to straw man the position because it's not it's criminalizing the act right. so it's whoever is electing it because we know it's not abortionist you know like abortionists don't wake up in the morning and grab their abortion tools and go find a baby to kill sure but I think that the, the problem like while I wholeheartedly agree with the position I think the problem is that if the entire um, pro-life people were to take that position, we would lose even more states to um, just the full pro-abortion position. When you look at even red states like uh, Kentucky very recently when it comes to the 2022 midterms, they had a, a vote to um, completely abolish yeah. um, and you know protect the unborn within their state constitution, and they voted against it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not Pretty much everywhere. Right, that's not even abolition, right? That's, 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 that's yeah. behind that. I'd say that's the that's fruit of the pro-life movement. So for, right. for five Gener for five decades, you've had even the most conservative Christian people being told abortion isn't a criminal act. So we've raised all these people to think it's not that bad, and they're kind of for it. And so when you come along to try to say, let's take it away, you find out, like, you've lost all moral ground. And, but the way to get out of that is not to continue to compromise. We need strong, clear truth. And whenever someone says, listen... I agree with you that abortions, murder, blah, blah, but like, according to the polls, we can't pass this, so we better compromise. I'd say you're just going to be, you're just being, you're just raising your hands and like, I would like to be responsible for the sad state of our culture in 10 years from now. Not necessarily. Like, I, the thing is, I think that if you have a, let's say a, a, you have no chance of a, passing a law in uh, Missouri or say a purple state like Florida or something, um, you have no chance of passing a law that would be an abolitionist law. There's no possible way, uh, yeah. at least, you know, to encourage the people within this time of an election cycle or whatever yeah. to completely abolish abortion and criminalize it. Yeah. Um, You're saying you, you, should, you should therefore do what? You should therefore pass um, laws that can reduce it as strongly as possible. So, for example, the heartbeat bill that passed very recently yeah. is fantastic. It's a great step in the right direction. I think uh, ones that obviously go all the way up to conception are yeah. uh, preferred and everything like that. But, you know, if it's in your ability to go from 10,000 to 8,000 per year, I think it mm. is uh, negligent to say, no, 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 we won't, we won't compromise at all. We'll go we'll yeah. zero or nothing. Well, you know, well, that's 2,000 babies you just missed out on saving. Uh, well, I'll, I'll argue like an incrementalist. Yes, that's my point. So I think incrementalism, incrementalism is superior to okay. radicalization. Uh, well, okay, let me argue like an incrementalist. If I may add real quick, I think there's a nice middle ground for both of you. I think legislatively, you should probably be a bit more incremental in some ways. Well, we live, just oh. to be clear, we live in the 50th year of the incrementalist who says they're doing the best, they're winning. Well, they're so not doing a good job. So all the evidence that the incrementalist says that their stuff is pragmatic and good is just 75 to 80 million murdered babies. Yeah, I think that incrementalists so, need to be more hardline on their position. I'm just saying, but, evidentially, yeah. they have, like, zero argument. So, like, the argument, like, we have to do this because it works, is kind of like, to me, like, I mean, just, just pushing back, just honestly, it's just, it's, it's kind of so, so false. Well, the problem is, a lot of these people, since it's been around for 50 years, there have been generations of people who have grown up thinking that they have a legal right to an abortion. Oh, yeah. And so these people have grown up thinking that this is a right they have as an American, and it's being taken away. Now, they don't have such a right. That's good. So I think 
morally and politicians need to take your position that this is killing. Like, yeah. I think that politicians need to say this, but when it comes to legislation, because people have grown up thinking that this is a right they have, it needs to slowly be taken away. Well, so, so you're not allowed to do this, but if you do it, you're not going to get in trouble. You're not allowed to do this after 144 days, but you can do it 143 days. So this is instruction to the culture, and you want to know yeah. why the culture is so... Like, why can't you... Why can't you even pass a bill to protect human beings with equality in a state like Florida? I would say because pro-lifers have educated that state to think that abortion isn't murder. There is no government policy in the United States that is consistent when it comes to morality around abortion, at, at least to my knowledge, when it comes to um, supporting life um, in a full sense. Like, heartbeat bills are not consistent, obviously. Because yeah, no, heartbeat... You're making four weeks versus six weeks, you know, that yeah. sort of argument. Like you but, said, heartbeat bills are good, and I would say heartbeat bills are well, if you want demonic. To, if you want to argue that um, or rad radicalism yeah. works significantly better than incrementalism and use the past 50 years as an evidentiary point yeah. that incrementalism doesn't work, I would say that prior to that, we mm -hmm. had the radical position. We had that point where when? it was fully criminalized, you know, to the point where, you know... Well, sadly not. Prior to, you know... Roe and everything yeah. before that, if you go back a century. So when Roe was passed in 72, basically the Supreme Court said, listen, you're not punishing the mother who seeks out an abortion, right. and you're telling us that this is murder. Right, I'm talking pre-Roe. Right, I know, but Texas law mm -hmm. held that abortion was wrong, but that it was not murder, and that you could not punish the mother, right? Which is like o Oklahoma law. It's like a felony, it's not murder. So the Supreme Court said, listen, you're inconsistent hypocrites. You're not treating abortion as murder, but you're saying it should be curtailed. If it's not murder, if you're not willing to punish people who choose it, then we're not taking you seriously. And that's how we got Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And so, like, so abolitionists aren't trying to return to Roe. Like, it's kind of like abolitionists don't even care about Roe v. Wade. It's like submission to Roe v. Wade led to a lot of lives being killed and was the excuse for not supporting abolition and all that kind of stuff. But we don't like... It's not, it's not the battle. The battle is, is like, is it sin? Is it murder? What do we do with those things? And so I think it's odd, it's odd because like I think the pro-lifer says we're trying to get the best that we can get, but in the process of getting the best that you can get, you're always losing. So like a, a good analogy is like chess. Like say you and I have been playing chess every year. We play a chess game every year, once a year. And back in 72, we start playing and uh and i'm the and i'm the pro-choice i'm the pro-abortion you're the pro-lifer and uh you take a pawn or two but i put you in checkmate and then like 30 years later you're getting better but i'm still getting you in checkmate and then i see that you're really getting good and i think well crap what do i do i need to continue to win i'm gonna let him take more pieces because this is the only way like oh my gosh they have ultrasounds you can literally see metal instruments stabbing into babies and they've got all these pictures, I better have, I better control the anti-abortion side. Right, but the radicalization point is... What, is it, what do you mean by radicalization? Okay, I should, sorry. I should say the abortion, the uh, abolitionist position is after 10 videos, I realize I'm losing and I throw the board. No, that's a, I, that's, I a, like that's a disingenuous straw man of it. Well, consider that... No one does that. No one, no one says throw the board. So the abolitionist goes... Let's put forward a bill to totally and immediately abolish abortion as murder without exception and compromise. Okay. And then pro-lifers kill that bill. Uh, and then you go back and you put forward the bill again. And then maybe one or two pro-lifers are like, you know what, I'm sick and tired of killing bills. I'm going to actually support a bill, even though it's not going to pass, but I'm going to support a bill that actually is what I say I believe when I'm at Sunday school. And so you slowly change it and then you actually get the right kind of people that are in the right kind of office that can support the right kind of bill. That's how you actually change things. Right. So you call it radical, but it is the sort of thing that well, changes. The on the issue. Well, it, it, well, I mean, you can go further so in crazy ways. Like well, is. yeah, I mean, so, so like, like, you know, Wilberforce, right? So he puts forward a bill to abolish the slave trade more or less every session. There's a few sessions where he's off, he's sick or whatever, but more or less every session, it's to abolish the slave trade. After about six or seven times, they start putting forward bills to regulate the slave trade, to give more space to slaves, and they pass those instead. Or they pass bills to abolish it gradually. They say, we agree with you, Wilberforce, but it can't do it overnight. 
the French would take advantage, it would be bad for our economy, let's pass a bill to gradually abolish slavery. They can't do it. Well, after 20 years, they're like, you know what, screw it. So should we go to war? Let's, well, they didn't go to war. Well, if we look at what they went to war. abolish slavery. Well, this is the slave trade in Britain, so they didn't go to war. But eventually, in 1807, whenever the Abolition of the Slave Trade Act was passed, it went in and it totally, you could not transport slaves with British vessels. And it wasn't incremental, it wasn't regulatory, but it did take 20 years. The, the thing is, is he put forward a bill to abolish it 20 years, and pro-lifers at the time kept it from being abolished by passing all these other things. And so it took time. Well. The abolitionist was never tossing over the board. In, in my analogy, the abolitionist isn't even playing. Like, it's the pro-lifer and the pro-choice are playing. And the pro-lifer is saying, well, I took a rook more than I took last year. But I don't argue from evidence, because I think there could be a way, like, you know, I try to just be reasonable about it, but it could be the way, the only way to say keep child sacrifice legal is to allow 10,000 less of them to happen well, every year or to happen in an uncounted way. Well, the problem is, is that I, as someone who um, is of faith, I completely understand we live in a fallen world. All of these terrible things that we that agree right? on are terrible things That's song, will right? occur. My goal, while it would be fantastic to you know, completely you know, criminalize it and have the best enforcement possible so that we know it will never happen, mm. it's just not possible. We don't have the resources for that. So what I think is, okay, I'm going to reduce this evil to the best of my ability. Like that, the, the other issue I have with this sort of point is that you pitch it in a way that makes it seem like um, the only way for someone to uh, be in support of the abolitionist position, uh, not just be pro-abolitionist, but also be of faith. And while I agree with you, more people should be of faith, 26% of atheists are take the pro-life position. And that is a huge swath of them that we're missing out on in this sort of messaging. To be well, they could still vote for abolition. Sure, but... They don't, you don't have to be a Christian to support abolition. Yeah, but you have all of this messaging that is specifically targeting um, one particular demographic when there's a lot of independents who might not be of faith and who could be turned off. Like, that's why you have all these uh, people who walk by who either completely tune you out because they hear only, you know, someone of faith is yeah. pro-life or... Um, I don't really buy it. Start flipping you off in that sort of sense. I just don't really buy it because I got like a YouTube and I got like a TikTok channel that's got five and a half million. We have fifty-six million views. Uh, in the most, there's a lot of. I don't. I don't think like I should let like that sort of thing control my message. Like if there really is a true good message, I think you should share it. Sure. Um, so, yeah. I mean, on like whether it sticks or not. The thing is, is like. I don't think our culture is the first culture in history that hasn't practiced child sacrifice. I think right. this is our culture's child sacrifice. Yeah. And I think it's like because we are in rebellion against God and all that kind of stuff. I don't think you do away with that without repentance. That doesn't require everyone becoming a Christian. But the people who are going to be leading this thing and fighting for this thing, like, they're going to generally want to have like, foundational reasons for why they believe what they believe. And the atheists may like hate abortion or hate murder, but they don't really have a reason for why that's bad beyond just a social compact and decision. Like, it's not, not a metaphysic. So, so that's why they generally don't tend to be the leaders of the movement. Um, but, I mean, if, if some... Well, we're they, looking they, for additional leaders. We're looking for members. We're looking for leaders. Well, yeah. Like, people typically don't have coming to Jesus movements all that often in their life. And, uh, and I say that, when I say that, I'm not saying that in terms of just faith-based. I'm just saying, like, a, something someone says that gives them a radical change in their worldview um, just yeah. in that instant. Typically what we see is, uh, like, we saw it when we had a, our Students for Life, we had a spring tour uh, specifically targeting chemical abortion and all the horrors behind it. Uh -huh. Environmentalism was a factor, but it was mostly based around um, how harmful it is to women and, um, uh, and how dangerous it is when it comes to that sort of stuff. And no, no, it's a weird argument. It's a compromising argument, but what it is... Oh, I mean, it's, it's just... It's just uh, I'll just tell you on the side, like on your concern about what's, what is and isn't convincing, women who want to murder their children don't care if it's kind of dangerous. They'll actually, well, they'll actually use coat hangers, really. I am, okay. I understand. And, and the pro-choicers actually, when you tell them things like, hey, this is really dangerous really for you, they don't, they don't care. No one cares. When you're sinning... If you have a God complex, you do care. 
Well, I'm, I'm just saying, just if you're, if you're judging things, like, like, for instance, like, the idea that women are victims of abortion is the only people who hold that are, like, professional pro-lifers. The, pro, the pro-choice movement actually calls themselves pro-choice. Yeah. They're choosing it. You actually talk to women who choose abortion and say, did you choose, did, did you did it, did you know you were pregnant? Does that mean you're with child? Did you choose to get child? Okay, the pro-lifers have told me that you're a victim. And they're like, they just laugh at it. Because the message has actually like been uh, constructed based on like trying to be winsome, not trying to be true. But like, I mean, people who do like any kind of illicit drug, it's dangerous for them, but they do it because they enjoy getting high or whatever. It's like the idea that people don't do things because it, I mean, we can tell them all day long that it increases breast cancer and abortion is not going to be affected really. Because you know what? People, okay, getting breast cancer in 20 years, they don't want to have a baby right then. I mean, it's just how we are as people. Why? Because it's a sin issue. This is really someone who's like in rebellion against God. So outside of the whole legal thing and everything, like if you're really trying to reach someone to try to save as many babies as you can, it's kind of like having the cure for cancer, the gospel, and not using it. Like... If you spend a lot of time and energy and money telling people chemical abortion is possibly bad for you, you know, I, I actually might find yourself lying. Like, I don't think it's actually uh, all that dangerous. Six percent of uh, women who take it. Have it's not as dangerous as like driving, for instance. Sure. But we're still going to drive. I think that's that's the way minds work. Right. You can this make isn't. That there's a lot of things that we criminalize when it comes to drugs and. Like that. I mean, the yeah. other thing is you have the... Uh, People just don't stop doing things whenever there's a 6% chance. Well, what I'm saying is... Is it really 6%? Wait, 6% is what? Um, it was a genuity study. So it was sponsored by Planned Parenthood. So you have that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 6%, 6% percent what? Of, uh, 6% of women who took the abortion pill uh, had unplanned visits to the ER. Caused by it. Yeah. Had what? Had what? Unplanned visits to the ER. And the idea um, there is that... I mean, that's still pretty low. Uh, if you're talking about in comparison to, like, because they, they think of it, the way that they view it is as a medical procedure, right? And the way that they consider, like, the pill is, you know, they, they say it's safer than Todd, which it's not if you actually... It's, well, the, sometimes they say it's safer than childbirth. Right, they make that argument. Because right. probably, because yeah. actually, uh, ch- childbirth, uh, much higher rate, 6%, that you have to go to the emergency room. Obviously, yeah. So, that's... The, the way that they... The other thing as well is when they, I mean, this expands kind of into the problem of, they say that the U.S. is terrible when it comes to, like, a infant survivability. Infant survivability, yeah. We account for all infants, including ones that are, like, uh, born uh, premature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way yeah. significantly less. You have European countries and things like that that... They just don't um, count that. They don't count that if it doesn't weigh enough, right? Yeah. They don't think it was alive because yeah. they have abortion. And there could be a, years. yeah, and there could be a million other causal things involved in that. I just think, I just think like, the, the, and I would just, you know, say, I mean, we may not ever talk again until like yeah. two or 3,000 years down the road and run into you up there or something. But like, it's a, it's a thing where like, I know that abolitionists, we can kind of come across as harsh or like, um, kind of like uppity or like taking the high road or whatever. But like, rather than sort of radicalizing us as like Puritists, Puritans uh, or ide- idealists and all this kind of stuff. It's really weird because what we are making arguments that are not pragmatic in one sense, but like at our heart, we are trying to argue that what we're suggesting is actually best. Yes. It's like, it's like we're, cause, because basically doing what God says, like he has like certain rules about how you fight evil and doing what God says is actually a better way to end an evil than doing what he, like, so you should never do anything that God hates. And if you can, like, look at the scriptures and say, oh my gosh, God literally, like, he says he hates this. If you're doing something God hates because it might save more babies, well, you've got, like, the maker of heaven and earth opposed to your bill. And so most pro-life bills have something like that in them because the construction is... I don't want to do what God does because God, what God does doesn't work. And so I'm thinking at about this stage in the whole deal, 50 years, I think it's time for pro-lifers to stop saying what they do works. 
well, let's consider the fact that, you know, if, if it is true that we have never in American history, or possibly in even world history, have had a policy like what the abolitionists support, where there's no exception and we criminalize uh, women, right? In our entire well, we have. Uh, well, so the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution was the total and immediate abolition of slavery in the United States. And so... I should say it, in practice. It took, it, in practice. it took a long time to get that done. Yes. But when they passed it, it was without exceptions, without compromise. Chattel slavery is criminalized. Right. I'm talking if, about abortion specifically. Well, I know, but like the thing that people would say up until that point is you can't do this because you can't just criminalize right, something. We had a war to get there. Well, we had much more than a war. We had, we had you know, decades and decades of people saying repent of the sin of, ch of chattel slavery. Yeah. And decades of pro-lifers saying, no, we can't, it's got to be gradual, it's got to be regular, you can't do it overnight, we've got to re-educate people, blah, 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 and then 30 years later, God's like, they're not repenting, the pulpits, the press, you know, the politicians, they're all basically either gradual anti-slavery people or whatever, they're keeping it around, God sends judgment of war. Right, so you had people like John Brown, who also in your name as an abolitionist went out and killed... Technically not. John Brown didn't kill people. Oh, technically he didn't do it as an abolitionist. He did it as a militiaman. He left the abolition movement and he explained to Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and various abolitionists, what you're doing hasn't worked. I'm going to go do this other thing, which is form a militia and whatever. So John Brown does that. He's not actually doing the work of an abolitionist. He's doing the work of like a freedom fighter or a vigilante or whatever you want to call them. But it's because he had given up on the idea of moral suasion. And he's very explicit about that. So William Lloyd Garrison, who I would say I follow today, that's who the modern abolitionist movement of abortion is modeled after, is the idea that we call the nation to repent of the sins of child sacrifice, as abolitionists have done with chattel slavery, with caste systems, with uh, slave trade, uh, with euthanasia in various places, with gladiator games, and with infanticide at the you know early early years of the church. So like, it's it's this desire to actually say this is an evil thing that we need to confess as evil and stop doing. Sometimes, if people say we're not going to do this. We're going to regulate it. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And you do that for a long time. Yeah, you will end up being judged with, like, war. And so that happened in the American context. You could argue it happened in the British context because pretty much following the delay of abolition and the preference for gradual abolition of the slave trade, Britain lost a war to America. And that was a judgment. And a lot of the abolitionists of slavery in Britain actually said, you know why we lost the war of the colonies? because we have not repented, we don't have God on our side and all this kind of stuff. So a lot of that, and it's not just rhetoric. Even if the, world's cult, even if the world is uh, totally secular and pluralistic and all that kind of stuff, you just got to say, is there a God or is there not? And does he care or does he not? And I think that the pro-life movement functions basically on an agnostic position, not just for political reasons, but in truth. Like, God is not involved here. He doesn't, I would disagree with that. He doesn't Many of the people within, uh, especially in the headquarters of Students for Life, are devout Catholics. We have uh, Nicole, for example, who is uh, our regional coordinator for both Missouri and Arkansas. So, yeah, I, um, that's true, she, but even at the SFL here on campus, they say we're not a religious organization trying to open it up to non-Christians, yeah. even though pro-life is ultimately Christian. Right. I, I'm not saying they profess Christian. I'm saying like they live as though God's not actively involved in this. Because like the way that so, they, they live and the way that their organization gives like a, espouses messages are two different things. Partially because which uh, you by only law, do they, they cannot do that, and that's what it says. Well, so God. Well, I'm not saying you have to put God in your legislation, like as in like God says da da da. Like so. So I believe. So God says. Uh, woe to those who enact iniquitous decrees that make the fatherless pray. Isaiah 10, 1, 2, right? What is that? It's writing a law that actually says fatherless children are going to be prey. So woe to those. Well, God says woe to those. Like, I won't, I, and he says multiple places, my face will be set against you, right? I'm not going to help you. I'm not with you. I am against you. You wrote a law saying fatherless children will be prey. 
any bill that has a rape exception in it, even if it's pragmatic, is being done as though God is not real. Because you're, you're basically putting something in your bill that kills it from the beginning. You know your bill sucks because God hates it and he's opposed to it. So it's not going to go anywhere or do anything. That's why like 350 pro-life bills that have been proposed with rape exceptions, if we don't put this rape exception in it, it won't pass. Lo and behold, don't pass. Or if they do pass, don't save anybody because there are so many exceptions. You just could continue to do everything you were doing. Um, but like, so that's what I'm saying. Like the person who's like, listen, I think that we should advocate for the rape conceived, but polls say this. So therefore I'm going to allow this evil in my bill for the greater good. That's somebody who is saying, I don't really believe what the Bible says about doing a little evil to get good. Because the Bible is very clear. Woe to those who do evil for good or call a little evil good. You know, all that kind of stuff. It's like literally said to be like satanic in thought process. So someone who's willing to do that, obviously functionally, is basically saying, I have no fear of God. But I do fear the people. And the poll tells me that I have to like allow this rape exception because I fear that if I don't do this and please the people, I won't be able to pass my thing. So that's why I mean functionally, there's an atheistic or an agnostic. Like, it's kind of a gamble thing. Well, every legislation is a gamble, to be fair. But if you are fully aware... I mean gamble with God. I would argue that while you can, you know, live your life, um, you want to live your life in a way that follows faith, um, doing it in a way that um, basically foregoes any reasonable opportunity to be able to but, do any good, I think that is, is negligent. I, I think the problem that we see with that is... What if, what if someone just rejects that whole thing? What do you mean? Like, obviously, I, I, I don't use the same terminology, so I don't know exactly what you mean. But like, so say I believe that there is a God, he did actually design reality, morality is based on his character, and he's revealed it in his law, and... Yeah. And he's given us a copy of it. We can read it. Um, so we have access to, like, the character and law of God. Um, we have that knowledge. It is not only what God says, but it's actually what's true. So I'm going to live my life consistently with what's true in reality. Doing things that are consistent with God's character and law are going to work best. Doing things that are inconsistent with reality are going to always refute themselves, undermine themselves. It's kind of like passing a bill that says you can't murder a baby because they have a beating heart is going to eat itself because you come back around and you're like, well, we actually need to protect babies before they have beating hearts. And I'm like, oh, wait a second, wait a second. You said, you said beating heart. What, what are you, why are you coming back for this? We're like, no, because I lied about why abortion was wrong in the first place. Because abortion isn't wrong because no, of a beating heart, absolutely right? absolutely espouse that abortion is wrong all the way to conception. Like, right. What you're, that's what I'm, he's saying. I support what his position, which is that, you know, you espouse exactly what you're saying. But, but can you, the way that you legislate is you legislate in a pragmatic sense. I'm saying it, that's how it hurts itself. So, like, you say, say you pass a bill saying that abortion is wrong because of uh, fetal pain. Like, they've past a lot of those, right? Fetal pain. And then you come back and you say, well, actually, we want to we move it down to a beating heart. And they say, whoa, 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 whoa. You said abortion was wrong because it caused pain. And now you're saying abortion is wrong because it stops a beating heart, which I think is stupid because like dogs have beating hearts and pigs have beating hearts and pigs are delicious. But so it's just a kind of a dumb thing and you're kind of like making culture dumb. But you're coming up with an arbitrary thing about it's usually a detectable beating heart. So then you have all sorts of things like, well, just don't detect the beating heart. You know, just put the ultrasound this way and kill the baby. Like, you have all this stuff. And then you say, well, listen, here's the deal. I haven't really been being honest with you this whole time. I think human beings are made in the image of God, and you can't murder humans because humans have rights inherent to what they are ontologically. Well, I'm telling all of a sudden, you, you're like, you oh, that's you, I, the... I keep saying, you can take his position. I'm just saying, when you propose bills, you can be incremental about it. And part of the issue... But what if your incrementalism refutes your position? Well, well what if... I, I was just been thinking about this. Because I, I, I'm slowly... Not even slowly. Like, I'm gradually becoming more and more on... Your no one becomes an immediatist overnight. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, 
I am an abolitionist, but I, I adhere more to the pragmatic, like, slowly dealing with it. Well, yeah, but, no um, one says it's going to happen quickly. Um, so I guess the question is, so if, and I think this is what kind of Connor is trying to say, is if right now in Missouri, if you have the abolitionists, but they're a minority, and they're calling for the complete abolition of abortion. Yeah. And everyone else is willing to be like, okay, we'll go this far. Should the abolitionists just not vote for it because it's not far enough? Or should they take what little gain they can right now while they're still pushing? Yeah. That, yeah. Like, I totally agree. Like, it shouldn't be. Yeah, I hear you. It should be c- criminalized completely. There, it, there's no exceptions. And I still agree with that. And I'm voting for this because it's a step in that direction, even yeah. though it's not as far as I want. I'm still going to advocate for this. But, but you don't have to be theoretical in this, of course. Well, and I think there are people who are like that, but I, I mean, guess the question is, would you rather it be, we're not going to do anything until it's complete abolition, or we well, see, do it slowly? So usually it's, so the accurate, the actual truth of the thing is, is uh, in Missouri, you have a uh, majority pro-life Republicans in the House and in the Senate and oh, the, the governor. the abolition pro-lifers? No, the pro-lifers. Yeah. They're pro-lifers. So you have all of the votes necessary to do absolutely whatever you want to do. Okay. Someone puts a bill in front of you saying abortion should be criminalized as murder, which would be the act. Therefore, we can start doing things like prosecuting, yeah. prosecuting like protecting preborn humans. It's not going to be yeah. perfect. There's going to be people who break the law, but we're going to at least establish justice in our laws. Uh-huh. And you put that forward, and the choice is do we pass this or do we not? Yeah. And they vote against it. That's uh, the actual reality. There's yeah. no, there's no, like well, in Missouri, there's nothing really else. There's not like a, I mean, you, you, you've and got. I would say that you're right. They're not really pro-life. I'm, I'm just talking. Well, no, if you look at the transcript from today's hearing, the reason they voted against the abolition bill is because they're pro-life. That's what they said. The well, art. I say realistically, like if you were genuinely pro-life as, like, as a person, not saying the organization is pro-life, you would vote for that, would you not? No. So I'm saying they're well, not genuinely. He's pro-life. definitionally saying pro-life people aren't abolitionists. Yeah, pro-life or the pro-life. Oh, you're, so you're not talking about the pro-life movement, are you? are just saying pro-life in organizations. Well, well, the pro-life. Well, so the pro-life organizations say that they speak for the pro-life movement. So when you have 72 pro-life organizations. Everyone from National Right to Life to the Southern Baptist Conventions, yeah. ethic, religious, like the Catholics, the Baptists, they pro-life, say. they all say together to, like in his language, to prosecute the woman is not pro-life. Pro-life is protect women and babies from abortion, okay, da da so, da da So you're, you're so they, completely rejecting the term pro-life. Well, no. Well, I, I let the pro-lifers decide what it means, and they say it means... Uh, anti-criminalized All right, okay. abortion. So, I think we're on the same page. I, so when I was saying pro-life, I didn't mean it as far as like someone who says like I'm part of the pro-life movement. Yeah. I mean like there's a lot of normal pro-lifers if you, that if you say I'm don't pro, know. Like when I say I'm pro-life, I mean it as in like I'm for the abolition of abortion. So I guess yeah. you would just say okay, well you should call yourself an abolitionist. Then. Yeah, that, that's helpful because they are saying the position of pro-life Americans is to oppose the, like his position. Okay, so the way I, I'm looking at it is if you have, say, they're pro-life legislatures, but they, but they uh, are, when they say pro-life, they mean abolition, which, I mean, that's not really the case, but yeah. I'm just saying. Generally, if they say pro-life, if you're talking about a legislator, they're usually connected to a pro-life organization, pro-life lobby, and so they are dead set on killing abolition bills before okay, they're even right. I get you. So, in, in office. So I guess I'll stop using pro-life and say you have a, a abolition minority. Which yeah. would probably be. Well, yeah, I don't think you have a minority here. I think you got maybe. I think you maybe got a couple in the House, a couple in the Senate, um, and they're converts to abolitionism, whether they're full abolitionists or not. You only have. You've, you of course, you've got Representative Mike Moon who puts forward a bill to abolish abortion. This is, I think, the fourth fourth time he's put it forward. Mm-hmm. It's always been killed because it's always been pro-lifers here. So pro choice, like pro choicers, can't kill anything in the state of Missouri. They can't kill anything in the state of Oklahoma. So maybe, fair enough. So well, it's not just pro choicers that are killing babies in Missouri. Sure. Like so I guess like my, today, it wasn't pro choicers who killed the bill to abolish abortion. Right. right. Theoretically. Think, right. Or technically, it was pro life. If the bill came across my my desk, I was a theoretical legislator, and it was an abolition bill, I would support it. But, as far but as what if it, what if Students for Life of America called you up and said, "Don't support that bill"? Yeah. Uh, that's good. I mean, and, and that's like uh, that's like hope for the. 
Well, I would say pro -life why are you calling yourself pro-life if you're against that? Which I get right. your point. Yeah, I just try to use it. Part I think a line has to be drawn so you can see what's happening. I get what you're saying, that the term pro-life has basically been bastardized. Yes. Or, well, like, say it hadn't been bastardized. Say it, it just, so, like, pro-life as a term, I think... It generally invented, you have pro-life, you have pro-choice. It's like, I am of the moral opinion to choose life. So pro-lifers talk about choosing life. Like it says like on the bumper sticker, choose life. Yeah. So it's like this, we, we, we recognize that there's a choice and we're the people on the moral opinion of choosing life. You don't really have that rhetoric much in the abolitionist movement because it's sort of more like a established justice for the fatherless, thou shalt not murder. So it's not really... It's, I, it's, I see the distinction. Like pro-lifers and abolitionists aren't sort of like kind of different because abolitionists are going farther or they're radical. It's just like fundamentally different worldview. Okay, yeah, like, I, I understand that. Like, that's why abolitionists are generally for the death penalty and pro-lifers are kind of not. Yeah, yeah. Because because pro, pro-lifers are pro-life. You don't even kill murderers, rapists, cannibals, whatever. Don't kill anybody. They're pro-life. Um, but abolitionists are like, well, no, justice. Establish it equal and you can't kill image bearers because if you kill image bearers you forfeit your life so the, the way i view it is that the government um, oversees those who are you know of god of faith um, such as yourself but then they also see people who reject it all in its entirety and are, right you know against god and part of the problem and obviously this is of everyone this is a, a a human flaw is that we all are selfish and we all respond to incentives in some sort of way yeah right? Yeah. So, and one thing that's a huge yeah. advantage of the pro-life movement is that their policy is we want to make abortion unthinkable, yeah. not just illegal. So that's why they support policies such as supporting local pregnancy centers and um, supporting adoption, promoting adoption. Yeah. Basically, in sort of ways that instead of where it's it's basically a, a question of carrot versus stick, right? Okay. Abolition and abolitionists, from what you're telling me, seem to be more on the stick side, where it's, it's specifically saying, look, you do this, a lot more active, we kill you. You know, well, punishment, basically, and that's what it says. That's, I mean, we're not bloodthirsty, but... Uh, but that's, that's the position. Well, no, the position is, is pro-lifers think you can make abortion unthinkable by also not criminalizing it. We support criminalizing it to doctors. Like, the, like, if you do this, if you elect to have an abortion, kill your baby... Yourself, with a surgical tool, coat hanger, pill, whatever. If you do that, we will protect you from those abolitionists who want to hit you with a stick. In the name of making this unthinkable. You know what would make abortion less thinkable? Right, the incentive of the stick. Well, not just the incentive of the stick, but people actually telling you it's murder. And then proving that they actually think it's murder by treating like do you th so like I'm I don't think murder should get well okay but do you think murder should be illegal so yes what do you think should happen to someone who murders like say he murders him so and it's and it's true and it's so life in prison so are you a Catholic okay so bah. okay so light so so basically so the murderer in your view gets life in prison not like the whole Genesis 9 6 thing, but like the well, whatever, see, not I, life in prison. I would support the death penalty if I could trust our government to right. a adequately uh, distribute it. Because the problem is that one in 12 people who are on death row are proven innocent at some point. And so at that point, the government, yeah. same as a as, uh, taxpayer funded abortion, is funding the death of innocent people. Yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, yeah. But they are. Yeah, I, I mean, the problem is, is like, I want. To be able to actually, I want the I want the justice system justice system to do it right and do it well. Yes. The answer isn't for them to not do it. But the uh, the thing I want to say is that that if if you believe that like part of the reason like he can't murder him or these people can't murder other people, born people. Now obviously it's illegal to murder born people. If you get caught, some states you're going to get life in prison. Life in prison with HBO. <laughs> uh, or some states you're going to get the, uh, the chair or the lethal injection. Yep. No state are you going to get sort of like, you know, terminated two weeks after your, or two days after your trial. Yeah. Now that would actually, actually establish a lot more justice and you have a lot less murders. I mean, there are people who murder people who are like, yeah, I'm going to go away for life, but you know what? Worth it, you know. Because it's just, you know, I mean, this is human nature. Like, punishments do curtail 
criminal behavior to a certain extent. Obviously not to an entire extent because people murder each other all the time. But say we were to say, well, listen, here's the deal. Let's just decriminalize murder and rape and pedophilia and anything because, you know, the same logic for why we shouldn't criminalize abortion. And then do we think that murder is going to go up or go down? Well, murder all of a sudden is going to become a lot more thinkable. Like if you said, you know what, no criminal, instead of making it life in prison for murder, we're going to try to make murder unthinkable. And chief among our reasons for making murder unthinkable, our, our projects to make murder unthinkable will be decriminalizing it. It just sounds asinine to the point of absurdity. And I want to get to that goal. I'm just saying that my way's faster. But it's not faster. Your goal hasn't happened. Well, no, we don't do our goal. We're the minority. We do yours. So you want to make abortion unthinkable by making sure that they know it's not criminalized and never will be criminalized. I, again, like I said, I want the same end game. Well, eventually. I think that the end game will happen. I'm just saying that our way is faster. Yeah, so there's this guy, I think Seth Gruber or something like that. He basically says something similar. He says, like, well, I do believe we should eventually criminalize it, but there should be a period of not criminalization to where we disciple the culture to understand what they're doing. So if you're concerned that women don't know what they're doing or that they're being victims or whatever, why not just, you know, pass a law saying abortion is murder, put it in the paper and say, hey, in the state of Missouri, abortion's murder. And if you do it, it's just like murdering a born person. That's gonna all of a sudden tell a lot of people a lot of things. Abortion's murder. If I do it, I'm a murderer. The whole like women don't know is gone. Now, if you wanna like delay it out, say here's the deal. We think abortion's murder and something should be done about it. We wanna make it unthinkable. To make it unthinkable, we're gonna basically tell people that they get 10, 15, 20, 30, I don't know, 40, 50 years of it not being a criminal thing. And slowly over that time, we will tell people that it's murder. But how can you tell people it's murder when you're telling them in your laws, this isn't murder? Is there pragmatism? It's, it's similar to- It's like undermining any, yourself. Well, it's similar to any radical, uh, I use the word radical, and I don't mean it in the derogatory or negative connotation. I mean it uh, a large change from what you're we like, have now. Um, I promise you I don't mean it. Anymore. Yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not offended. I, um, I, yeah, you're saying but, but, radical change. So, for example, a, a policy I support is basically abolishing the majority of the welfare system. Okay. But what I understand is, one... There's so much peop- so many people on it that are so doing away with it immediately. Doing away with it will basically yeah. put people out in the streets in masses. Yeah. Two, that... Um, it would be a pretty harsh, quick be reality. Pretty harsh. Three, no, no one would allow me to do that, basically. I would, yeah, yeah, I yeah. couldn't convince everyone to do that immediately. Yeah. You could However, say something like that, but you couldn't really campaign on it. Exactly. So sure. what I could do is have transitionary period or move over time. So, for example, eliminate the marriage tax. Right, move in that sort of direction where you just wean people off yeah. government support that's been living on it for years. Yeah, there's places where I think this is appropriate, and there's places where it's less appropriate. Yes, the, so the, I would say, say your key difference between the two is welfare is not necessarily against the Bible, whereas like, abortion is 100% against the Bible. In both sense, you're using pragmatism to get to your your. Well, end. well, I kind of see what he's saying because with look at evolution in its original state being for slavery. They tried gradual things, but it was just kicking the can down the road and it ended up in a war. And um, and the only reason, but I think one of the differences is the reason that the, you know, we were able to pass the 13th Amendment is because all the opposite, or most of the opposition for it had seceded. So there was well, no yeah. one really to vote against it. Well, it's a very, it's a, it's a super complex situation, but what really happens is you've got in the United States of America from the founding of the nation, legal protection for slavery written into the Constitution in a few ways. Like, it's actually interesting to think of it. Like, three the people who took yeah, the three fifths colonized, there was a fugitive slave law. All that stuff is in there, and it's there from the beginning. So you have this problem from the very beginning, and you have people saying, we need to get rid of slavery. You have that from the beginning, too. You have people saying, hey, Let's found this as a nation that doesn't have slavery. Let's honor Jesus. And those people were like, get out of here. We're going to compromise. We're going to allow slavery. So it was like a ticking time bomb. Well, eventually, the because like the Supreme Court and the laws, they had basically the Fugitive Slave Acts. Like when slaves ran away from the south to the north, in the north, you couldn't help them. You'd get in trouble. Right. And so like 
abolitionists would get in trouble uh, working on the Underground Railroad. Well, eventually, they were no longer getting in trouble. They were, it, the abolition idea had grown enough where they're just kind of like, you know what, we're going to help slaves and screw you guys. Like, and all, whenever the South saw like Wisconsin Supreme Court basically saying, we're not going to recognize the fugitive slave law. We're going to help people. We're not going to punish abolitionists working on the Underground Railroad. The South said, oh, we're going to secede because Northerners are practicing nullification and they're not obeying the laws protecting slavery. And so they threatened secession. And then the North, which doesn't like secession because they're trying to keep the country together, goes to war with them and in the process says it's about slavery. Because in a lot of sense it was because they wanted to secede to practice the peculiar institution of slavery. But the North was like willing to win the war and keep slavery. But after years and years of saying we're fighting this to end slavery, and then you have the Emancipation Proclamation with a Northern victory, Abraham Lincoln's not an idiot. He's like, oh crap, I've got to abolish slavery. And so he's whipping the votes and he's putting together a cabinet. He's getting them. They have to pass this thing because if they don't, what was the war for? Right. So, but it, it all happens. And whenever Abraham Lincoln, you know, celebrates the 13th Amendment, he credits the Garrisonians and the army. The Garrisonians, they were the abolitionists who changed the culture's mind on slavery and the army who won the victory. And so he says these things, like he'll, he'll, he'll say, you know, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Uncle Tom's Cabin, she caused the war because she made it. Now, it's a really complex situation, but I, what, what I would say is the important lesson is that there was a small group of people standing up sla- saying chattel slavery is a great, horrendous, wicked sin, yep. and we have to repent of it. Yep. Stop tolerating it. And there were a lot of people saying, you can't do this overnight. It's going to be like, destroy the economy, and black people and white people are going to be having babies, and you don't want that. All these excuses. And eventually they just kind of say, like, all your excuses delaying this are going to lead us into ruin. we got to abolish it. And they did it. That route also led to the bloodiest war in American history. And if you but that was because people were pro-lifers, well, is what I'm saying. Think, well, if you think they were gradualists. Like, they rejected abolition. I mean, that's but, why you had the war. Well, considering, let's, con- let's, let's, let's just say, say for the apostles. founders had taken your abolitionist attitude, they would never have been a country. Virginia would never have been That's what I'm saying. Control. Let's say for... Let's they could have maybe fought for it. So let's consider for a second... Instead of compromising. In a, in a hypothetical It's kind of hard world. to say what would we do, what happened. In a hypothetical world... On a federal basis, we took the abolitionist position and passed a law that criminalized abortion. Yeah. Do you think any of the pro-choices, pro-abortionists, any of them, would take that city down? No. No, they would th- just secede. They would threaten. Not only would they threaten to secede. I mean, this is yeah. likely. We're talking about a, yeah. a group of people. Who yeah, yeah, yeah. After. I'm not years. saying it's not. Gonna, I'm not saying it's going to be easy or not messy. I think if we started, if we started abolishing abortion in any states, California would be like, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, freaking heck, no, Dobbs. Dobbs says we have the right to kill our babies here. Dobbs, Dobbs, Dobbs. And they'd be citing your vaunted pro-life thing Messy to, to a, justify their abortions, their peculiar a institution. For, you know, horrendous war. We're talking about uh, a country right now who, after seeing a misleading video regarding uh, police involvement, burns the country for months. We're talking about after yeah, the Dobbs decision well, that only alone. because it was allowed to happen. Sure, but yeah. that's what I'm saying. We're living in a time where tension is allowed to get this high. We're, we're talking about the fact where he just threatening to do the Dobbs decision, not even an abolitionist position, but just the Dobbs decision, yeah. had three different justices uh, with assassination attempts or assassination threats. Sure. You know, we're, ta- we're, we're talking about a point where, yes, not only is secession going to be threatened, but the fact that as of right now, when consistently polled, California and Texas, about a third of citizens there say they would support yeah. state secession. Yeah. That is going to go dramatically up at least in California, possibly in New York, and even further. Sure. Messy, I think, is a light, light way of putting yeah. a horrendous war. Say, say, yeah, say super, super hard. Yeah, so what, so, what, so what are you willing to do to end a Holocaust? Fight a war or not? Because most people say that they support the Allied war against Nazi Germany. Okay, and so it's you would go to war for this? Well, I'm not saying, now my, my, my thing is repent of the sin of child sacrifice. Okay, but, but if the pro-lifers works? keep on killing abolition and keeping people from, like if, if I can convert 
of pro-lifers or whatever to abolition, I think we're, we're going to be doing pretty darn good. All right, well, I guess I need 100% of pro-lifers. Yeah, you need, you need 100% of pro-lifers. But that's, if you can get, you if you can have... get pro-lifers to become abolitionists, there is a peaceful political means by which you do this. And all along the way, there's all sorts of education and programs and help and everything you can do that isn't contrary to what you don't have to undermine your argument the whole way through. But I would say I'm for repentance and revival and the country getting its head right. Not everyone has to become a Christian. Like it was literally like 98% of the leaders of the abolition of chattel slavery in America were like hardcore Bible thumping Christians, like pastors and stuff. Like everyone today, all these non-Christians, they say they're against slavery and that they would have been against it in the 19th century. It's not true. They've right. inherited that right. view. Yes. They've inherited, they think they're against slavery. Well, it's because it's popular to be against slavery. Yeah. But the 3% of abolitionists in the country are saying this is evil, God's gonna judge us, blah, blah. They so succeeded in transforming the heart and mind of the culture that today everyone says that they hold that position. So I do believe that we could do that in regard to abortion we could do something along the lines of what happened in Britain, where you do have a bloodless abolition act. But I think you're right in that there will be states, because we've done such a terrible job educating and talking to people about why abortion is the inhumanity that it is. We've made it so thinkable. We've undermined all the moral arguments. We've said it's about beating hearts and the ability to feel pain and all sorts of just total trash arguments like that that we've kind of lost our, our moral, uh, you know, ability to kind of tutor people. So we're in a terrible position. I feel like we're like in the position of like Nineveh. Like it's so bad that like we're, we need a miracle. We need like, but, you know, while I don't think it happens all the time, if you had something like, say you had like a president who's as loved as Barack Obama whenever he was first brought in. And he's sitting there, he's this liberal, progressive, pro-abort guy. And God gets a hold of him and he goes on, goes on TV for the, the State of the Union address and goes, guys, here's the deal. We are a nation that practices child sacrifice. We're killing our children. Unquestionably, this is what we're talking about. Here's the science. Here's the theology. Here's the ethics. Here's the morality. We are wicked people. And I'm convinced if we don't stop doing this, we're going to be judged and like leads the nation. I mean, I don't know what that looks like because I only read about that a few times in history, like Josiah and whatever, Nineveh and stuff like that. But theoretically, it's still possible. I think the thing that works against that is the creation of a good position that lacks all that moral clarity. So like in... Uh, you know, you talk about like controlled opposition, like say, let's, I believe there's a devil. I don't know how much power he has, but he's good a liar. But like controlled opposition where you're like, listen, I've got a culture of people that are killing their babies, but they're developing ultrasound technology. What am I going to do to keep this around? I basically got to create controlled opposition. The group that's against it is going to actually be the group that keeps it legal by being kind of against it. And I can create a chess game where I always win. I let them take a few pieces, celebrate it. They can win votes for their political party. They can get jobs. They can feel good about it. They will always be pro-life. I will always be pro-choice. And regardless of whether the pro-lifers or pro-choicers are in power, abortion will be legal. Let me invent that. And that's, like, that's the honest position of where I think we are. And that's why abolitionists are, as a group, more intent on getting pro-lifers to become abolitionists than they are getting so pro-choicers. What I would say is that comparing the abolitionist position today, or at least the movement today, to the abolishing slavery in the 1860s is that the stakes are significantly higher under the threat of war today. Uh, consider the fact that the United States, as of right now, basically is the world's leading provider for many uh, impoverished nations. So if we're going to go to war, we're sentencing yeah. Of to starvation in third world countries. Not only that, you know, you're talking about millions of Americans, just you know, offshoot who are just now going to die by pitting war against each other. So, Not to mention the fact that someone's going to take control of nuclear weapons. I mean, we're looking at just tons of different threats that weren't a 
thing back then that incrementalism is the only safe way in terms of not causing mass extinction by the United States going into civil war. Well, I don't even think you're going to get incrementalism from incrementalism. You might get incrementalism from abolitionism. If more and more people call for the total immediate abolition of abortion as murder. You might, might, you might get incrementalism, but I don't think you ever get incrementalism from calling for incrementalism. And your biggest threat is God, not so, these other nations. You're a Christian, right? Yes, sir. So, I, I agree that abortion needs to be outlawed completely, needs to be annihilated, and so do many of the people who are uh, guilty of it. But it's not the only issue. Like, think of like the trans phenomenon. That needs to be blocked. That needs to be fought. Yeah, I think it's all. Yeah, I think it's all connected. We focus entirely on abortion. We, we start losing. Abortion. Yeah. Well, no one advocates you should. I don't think. Well, I guess some people do. I don't. Almost nobody does. I agree. But blocking the other things, you know, from the more pragmatic concerns to the moral concerns, like you know, why is sodomy legal? Why is child mutilation legal? Why yeah. Is legal? Because these reasons. Because pluralism, secular people, we can't get the best. So since we can't get the best, we got to allow this, allow this, and there's no truth, no blah, 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 and then you get everything we got. Well, that's true. But that's why. As useless as Republicans are, at, I know I know you're president of the Republican I agree with Republicans are useless. Well, we've got... We, <laughs> yeah. Well, no, all, all grassroots Republican people think that the parties basically become useless. And then you move up, and then you kind of become part of it. It's a big, massive thing. Oh, problem. I, I understand. I'm just, yeah. like, I, I agree that they are useless. And I, I don't really yeah. think the Republican Party is saved. Yeah, it's... New conservative I, I, I mean, just, you should get back to it. But I actually, so, obviously, it seems, like, I don't necessarily see any difference when there's a Republican in power or a Democrat in power in a lot of ways. Obviously, there are some effects, but... Generally speaking, there is a constant decline to where, like, Republicans today would not get votes from anyone who was Republican 50 years ago. You'd be like, what the heck? Is the Republican Party just, like, turning a blind eye to, like, drag queen story hour? It just doesn't, like, it just, there's there's not, they're so out of touch. But I would say, how do you get there? You don't get there overnight. You get there through incrementalism. And because the belief that was the culture declines, you kind of have to cater to it in order to stay in power. You get more and more corruption and compromise to where like you're almost indistinguishable from your opposition. But as long as you can still say you're worse, Donald Trump can say, hey, I'm not Hillary. And everyone's like, you're not Hillary. And then he's like, but I am going to give Planned Parenthood $550 million. Well, he gives more money to Planned Parenthood than Barack Obama, but he wasn't Hillary. No, I get your point. Uh, well, every time you vote for someone who compromises, you tell the Republican establishment, all you got to do is just be a little bit better than the Democrat. Fair enough. And so they're just like, keep on compromising. So it would be painful and possibly hurt people or something if all actual principled Republicans who cared were like, no, you're not getting my freaking vote. If the Republican Party said, we just lost the presidency by 35 points and we did some polls and it turned out those 35 points belonged to people who wanted us to criminalize abortion you know the next presidential candidate for the republican party is someone who wants to abolish abortion because you can't win the presidency for the party without having that but instead we reward compromise and so i just think that like all of the issues that y'all are talking about are real issues but you gotta say like, how did it get the way that it is? And then say, the things that I'm saying are the pragmatic and good things, are the things that we've been doing for my entire life. Yeah. Like I, I'm here's assuming a, you guys are in your early 20s. I wanna throw out there. So say Republicans who are abolition, are people who are abolition yeah. who stop voting Republican, or yeah. at least for the, camp, for the Republican It's very scary. In their area that would win. Because, I mean, I think it's pretty fair to say that abolition is not the winning vote for a Republican. Currently. All right, now. It's, it's and, only happened in one county yeah, for in the, the for United the States. Yeah, for overall Republican Party, it's one, not a winning position. Yeah. So, say, all right, we're going to not do that. And yeah. I think that would force Republican change. But the problem is, if you automatically have this huge influx of Democrats, and they could vote and enshrine abortion into law. 
that's a possibility. Not yeah. to say it couldn't be undone in the future as sure. like Republicans change. Yeah. But then, well, I mean, what's the I difference? Think, well, the difference is... I mean, I think limiting it is worse than unlimited access, don't you? Yeah. Even though it's not... Uh, perfect, you'd, like, you'd be surprised perfect. statistically. Like, if you, would, you, if you would look at, like, how many abortions happen under a Democratic president versus under a Republican president, it would be a shocking... Wow, more happen under a Republican? It's weird. But that's, that's a, that's a, that's a I, I'm st- not statistical wrong, anom- just, anomaly that's... Tr- like, more babies are aborted under George Bush than under Barack Obama, for instance. Yeah, and I... I'm not disputing that. Um, I just, I don't know. I just think it'd be worse if it became law that abortion is a legal right that you have but, versus it not being a legal right that you have. Maybe. Even though there are like exceptions, even though there shouldn't be any. Yeah, it's not simple. It's a pretty complex it's, deal. It's but very in a sense, what I wish would have happened is the Supreme Court would have said, uh, like, I wish the, like, the Dobbs decision would have been like, straight up, no, abortion is a constitutional right. We are not doing away with this, blah, blah. That would have been the best possible thing because that would have woken up tons of Christians. Oh, what these abolitionists are basically saying is true. So, like, what was constructed was this sort of thing, like, give them a victory. They can say, peace, peace, we are winning. And we can still murder a million children. And we're just not going to count them that's, anymore. That's a misassumption of statistics when you say that... Um, you see charts that say more abortions happen under Republican presidents because that's the same line that uh, Democrats make when they say that uh, the economy, the GDP grows mm-hmm. more under Democratic yeah. presidents. Well, I'm not so relying on it supremely. We reject, well, therefore, we should reject um, Republican economic policy. The, the thing yeah, is yeah, that yeah, legislation... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't make that big of an argument on it. I, well, because legislation yeah. lags, right? Yeah. So when we see uh, legislation under Bush you know, pass when it comes to at least more Republicans taking in Congress, both in a federal way and a state way, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you yeah. see pro-life policy, and I say pro-life, not pro-abolition, yeah, yeah. pro-life policies take place that come into effect under Obama. Then you see now with Obama, who's leading in more Democrats come into policies, and so they will start putting in more pro-choice things. So then under Trump, it appears as if abortion is going up. Sure, sure. It's, I, I it's understand. It's a lag. Not necessarily yeah. that they are endorsing abortion, or that because Republicans are there, it is leading to abortion. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I agree. I think I agree with what you're saying. It does kind of mess with the general mathematical strength of the argument. But the, what I'm saying is that regardless of whether you have a pro-life or, or pro-choice or in the Oval Office, abortion is legal. And regardless of whether you have pro-lifers or pro-choicers as the majority in the Supreme Court, abortion is legal. Because even in Missouri, where you say, let's abolish abortion, they say, no, we're keeping abortion legal because you have pro-lifers. Yeah. But if you don't have pro-lifers or pro-choicers, any of abolitionists, you get abortion as criminal. So I'm saying that the idea like, oh, like it's very scary. We might lose some elections for a cycle or two and that's going to cause all these deaths. I'm going to say, I'm like, no, you winning elections causes all these deaths. And so, like, I haven't that studied... That's untrue, as we've stated earlier. Well, no, Matt, well... It's, it's a fallacy to confu- conflate uh, well, legality with uh, criminalization. Well, here, do it like this. Pro-life. Make it a big... Make it a, make it a lag. Right. So, so think of it like, like drug policy, right? You have three different positions. You have legalized drugs, you have uh, decriminalized drugs, and then you have illegal drugs, right? Okay. Those are your three positions. It is the same thing with the abortion argument. You have legalized abortion, which is the pro-choicers, all the way up to birth, everything. Then you have the pro-lifers who say... Um, legalized abortion for mothers. Right. Legalized abortion for mothers, however... But you know, not for abortionists. Not for, not for abortionists. Uh, shut down the clinics, the mobile abortion clinics, and all that sort of But protect mothers who, who. But protect mothers. Yeah. And then you have the abolitionists who, who say it's completely. Uh, Criminalize the act of abortion. Criminalize the act of abortion, yeah. right? So you're conflating the two, it makes it appear as if pro lifers are as bad as the uh, pro choicers, which. Uh, well, in the Venn diagram, pro choicers say never criminalize women who abort their babies. And pro-lifers say never criminalize women who abort their babies. So that's their overlap. Yes. Pro-choicers say criminalize whoever is causing the death of an unborn child. Um, so, so pro-lifers and pro-choicers are identical on the issue of criminalization, and they're the opposite of the abolitionists. 
So it's again not with criminalization because the thing that they disagree on is the actor. Yeah. No, but see, no, it's that's not true. Uh, Pro-choicers believe that the abortion is only allowed when the mother chooses it. So pro pro-choicers don't lie about it. It's like yeah. pro-choicers believe yeah. that women choose abortion. Now, if a man is with a woman and she's pregnant with his child and he slips her an abortion pill, they believe that he should get in trouble because they believe that abortion should be criminalized if it's not the mother. Right. So pro-choicers and pro-lifers have the... Well, they argue not consent. They don't argue uh, the, the abortion policy when it comes to that sort of thing. I mean, if... well, I'm saying they, they think abortion... Like, do they believe that... They, so they think that abortion... They think that a mother should be able to visit an abortionist or an abortion pharmacist. Right. When pro-lifers say she's allowed to get pills from an abortionist, like so I would say she's the abortionist. So the mother is the abortionist. Yeah. Sometimes she needs the help of a pharmaceutical company. Other times she needs the help of a surgical well, precision person. You, you keep saying that... Um, but she's definitely the cause. Incrementalism doesn't work. It does work, just not for us. I mean, look, look take the pro-choice side, for example. Right? They, do you believe that Hillary Clinton or Obama, mm -hmm. s since they entered public life, um, supported abortion all the way up to term, all the way up to, to nine months? No, probably not. They probably want to erode, like... You think they evolved? Well, no, pro-choice... Like pro-choicers them, themselves? Sure. Those specific figures? Sure. I think pro Obama probably was always pro-abortion. Okay, but, but his argument in 2008, but, 2012 was yeah. safe, legal, and rare. That was incremental. Yeah, and that now is the position of the pro-life movement, right? No. Safe, legal, and rare? Abortion hurts women? I thought that's like on your banners and stuff. So abortion hurts women. Well, you, said, you were telling me about a chemical people. abortion thing. Abortion is dangerous for women. Yeah, that was that particular event. So that's our, part... Our mass belief is not that. Yeah, I know, but... That is a small part of our belief. But, but incrementalism to make it more rare, safe, get rid of the dangerous chemical abortions... We don't want it to occur at all. And keep it legal safe. for mothers. I'm just saying safe, legal, and rare is the technical, proper description of the pro-life movement's position. Well, because when it comes to abolition, we want it to be completely gone. But the problem is, is that we don't believe we can get there right now. Well, and the the, the pro-abortionists have proved incrementalism by demonstrating that okay. Oh yes, evil to, people do use the incrementalism. Right. That's, Anyone that's, can use incrementalism. You can. Yeah. You, okay. Evil people breathe. Right. You know, yeah. Just because they. Do I would say they. I would say they're sorry. effective. Propagandists are immediatists for evil, and they call for like full-blown stuff, and then they take what they can get. Right. That, right. That, that's the point, is that's, that they... Which is, the which is what abolitionists... The successfully is. use incrementalism in every single uh, position. And you look at guns, and you see them being more and more regulated. You look at LGBTQ, you see them more and more expanded over the years. Yeah, 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 yeah. Obama, in 2008, said marriage is yeah. between man and woman, and now we're here. Yeah. Right? So the, I agree with you. You know, to, to me, I think you're speaking the biblical language here. I think the idea but is like if your si if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to gouge it out, if you're in an adulterous affair, don't go down from like twice a week to twice a month to long walks on the beach. You have to like the the biblical way of dealing with evil is Stop. radical, but the 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 worldly way of keeping evil around is incrementalism. Like let people have a little bit, and then you can get a little bit more and a little bit more. Or if they're trying to get rid of something, let them keep it around just a little bit. They'll never get rid of it. Well, consider it through, I consider it rehabilitation instead of, uh, so th think of it in a way that the, the right wing, for the most part, has not taken up or utilized uh, incrementalism in hardly any policy. I mean, consider, um, what? Uh, successfully, I should say. I mean, consider the, the when we're talking. Well, yeah, because you can't do good incrementally is what I'm saying. That's the... You can do evil incrementally because it allows like a little, but like if you're trying, say you're, say, say you're trying to stop some evil thing from happening and you say all along the way to stopping this evil thing, we're going to allow this evil thing for all these other reasons until we eventually get rid of this evil thing, you will keep that evil thing around. So incrementalism is good at keeping evil or allowing it to grow. It is not good for getting rid of evils. That's why Jesus says what he says about sin. That's why whenever 
So like, you know, Moses and Pharaoh and the whole thing, familiar? Like when Moses, he gets the message, go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, right? And he goes, and he's kind of timid. And he's like, oh, let us go. We need to worship God and stuff. And Pharaoh's like, no. And it's kind of, whatever, who's your God? And it gets worse. And then Pharaoh, and then Moses looks like a laughing stock. And they're all like, what are you doing? It's making it worse. Well, after two or three plagues, Pharaoh's like, oh, my bad. I'll let you go for three days. But then you got to come back. And Moses is like, no, let my people go. And then there's more plagues. And then Pharaoh's like, hey, come back in here. This sucks. How about I let you and your women go? Or you, the men go, but not the women. No, let my people go. You and the women, but not the children. Let my people go. How about I let you, your women, your children, just not your animals go? And freaking Moses is like, not a hoof will remain in Egypt by that time. Like he's like, your incrementalism, all your deals that you're offering me are just ways to keep us enslaved because that's, that's the hook. Like give people a little bit of good instead of a real good and they'll bite it and they'll, they'll stay oppressed. So, that, like, so I think that's the model. Like evil does work that way. And you can get a culture to go from sort of like the sexual revolution to like men saying they have well, uteruses I, I think what gradually. Trying to, the point he's trying to get across, which I can understand, because I'm sympathetic to your case, but in America, the way legislation is passed, it, it would be... Well, it takes right, time. Right now, it would be virtually impossible to just sure. tomorrow say abortion is illegal. Yeah, it's and that's not where we're saying you have to... It's not, we're not... Well, overnightism... Yeah, it's, it's not our view. It's got to happen slowly because the way it works in America, th- yeah. you have to have the way laws are passed. It has to be gradual. Well, and, and yeah. I think that growth, in, growth in an idea is generally gradual. Conversion to an idea is gradual, generally speaking. Like, I think we get to abolishing abortion gradually over time well, by calling for it, but we never get to it by calling for incrementalism. Yeah, you only, okay. I mean, like, you can't say abortion is bad and we're going to get rid of it, but all along the way we're going to allow it. Well, someone says abortion is bad, we're going to get rid of it totally. And they say, well, you got six votes. You lost. Next, next year, abortion is bad, we're going to get rid of it totally. If we don't do this, blah, 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 blah this is killing our children, all, y'all, all the stuff you can say. You know what? You got 12 votes. It's not enough to pass. And you keep on going back. And you keep on going yeah, back. I, it's going to take saying. time. So it's not overnight, but I don't think you ever get there without calling for it. I think that's true, and I think we should call for it. I think the point that he's trying to make is that, okay, are you going to reject <laughs> um, attempts? Because you said, you know, you, even it's limiting evil. It's not eradicating evil. You're just slowly limiting it, right? Yeah. So like, so like a heartbeat bill or a fetal pain bill is like saying, these are the kind of, like, so the bills that passed a lot were, like, dismemberment abortion bills. Like, if you ever read any of those, they were celebrated and praised, dismemberment abortion bans, that sort of stuff. Well, waiting for a child to, waiting to say, hey, you know what, we won't allow this child to uh, be mutilated until they're 18 is just as bad as saying we're going to mutilate them. Nice talking to you. Yeah, same man. It's just going to, you know, wait just as long, or it's going to be just as bad as uh, saying we're going to go ahead and allow you to mutilate them now. So we might as yeah, well but, eh. get what we can and then work our way back as the culture turns. So like the dismemberment bill says you're not allowed to dismem- dismember a baby with forceps, mm-hmm. but you are allowed to dismember a baby with a vacuum aspirator. So that's right, what the so bill, about, like, the terms, right? that's what the bill says. It says you can't dismember a baby with forceps, but you can dismember a baby with a vacuum. I would support that if the previous, uh, if in a con world, if an against that bill is allowing everything. So, so, so they say you're, so we're not allowed to kill babies with forceps. We are allowed to kill babies with a vacuum thing. And then you wonder why 25 years later, you're still killing babies with vacuums. To a, see, but the, the point. And the I number hasn't changed. The number's the same. You, it, more babies are killed with vacuums than forceps. And if you say no forceps, you just kill them a little earlier. You just have more, you have more, you have more cultural instruction to like make the decision before 16 weeks by 14 weeks or whatever it is. I'm just saying like, I, like I that. With, I agree with you that we should espouse ideas in a public forum, exactly what you're saying. With the exception of, I think that we can be 
I, I disagree with you that religion has to be infused with abortion, but that's a whole other point. I think that I infused with abortion in the sense that um, you, you say that you, you make an appeal to authority, which won't reach uh, atheists in the slightest, won't convince them yeah. to support your policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let's let's just discuss your. Policy. I do think the atheist's problem is that they don't believe in God. Obviously, yes, that is their issue. But we need to. Yeah. Uh, it's another. But problem. you don't it's think that's. Problem. But the, what, if you, there, just, you think the best way, best way to reach an atheist is by not talking to them about God? I think that the best way to reach through to an atheist is to uh, op- enlighten them to um, positive benefits and lifestyle choices that come from the, someone who believes in God. Mm-hmm. And then once they start making those positive lifestyle choices, say, okay, well, how do I maintain these? <laughs> what if they're an atheist because they like the fact that it makes them, uh, it justifies their rampant sexual immorality and their back whenever they were raised Christian, see, all the that, masturbation made them feel bad, so see, they decided to become an atheist. See, and again, so they wouldn't feel bad. See, now when we look at like... Okay. Trying to say, like, I'm saying trying to trying right, to but, get them to, to think, oh, there's benefits. I think the reason they're atheists, mm-hmm. this is my particular belief, yeah. I'm not debating with you, is to justify their sin and shame and all that kind of stuff. Yes. And they actually know there's a God. Yeah. They're just kind of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness right. in order to sin. So like trying to reach them by saying, you'll have a better life is kind of like, I mean... It's interesting. It's not biblical. Well, it's well the way that I, I, I see it is, is that it, it's, it, while it's, it's great when it happens, it's rare when you see people make a radical worldview just as a snap like that. The, the way that I see it is when someone hmm. grows up and lives their life um, you know, in a sexually promiscuous way and ends up um, you know, a, a baby mama or you know, something along those lines, where mm-hmm. they, they basically have all of these detriments that have been caused through their promiscuous lifestyle. Um, it's a harsh but valuable lesson that you know basically leads them towards God, and that yeah. they can teach the next generation. Yeah. Don't make the same mistakes I did. Because yeah. it's really difficult to be able to tell someone, don't do this when you know they don't believe in God right then and there. It's going to be really hard to convince them. Yeah. There that God exists. Well, I mean, just side note, just sharing differences. I believe yeah. that like a, a, everyone walking around generally has some kind of knowledge that there's a God and there's a right and there's a wrong and there's evil and they have it sort of like inherent to themselves as a human being, made in the image of God with a moral compass and all kind of stuff. And yes, there's all sorts of indoctrination and co- competition for that, but somewhere deep inside there's a conscience and a knowledge, right? And I think they kind of know that they're guilty before God. On top of that, God fills the world with people who tell them, you know, the Bible's here, the people preaching the Bible's here, the idea that God hates sin and and wants you to do good and love your neighbor, it's all here. And they're living around in it and around it. And the last thing they want is for Christians to come up and say, hey, here's the deal. God hates your sin. He will judge you for your sin, but he also wants to redeem you if you would put your faith in him. You know, like that. I think the thing the the atheist who's suppressing the truth and unrighteous, and this doesn't want to hear, is you're a sinner standing before God, and you'll stand before Him someday. And you know they want to like argue about archaeopteryx or hominids or evolution or whatever. They want to do something like that. You know what they don't want to talk about? The fact that the real reason that they rejected God is because it freed them up to no longer feel bad about their homosexuality or or whatever it is. And so. That's, that's why people like us, even in the midst of the abortion debate, go to that because it's kind of like, what's really going on here? Is this person okay with child sacrifice because they don't know when life begins? Hey, thanks for watching this pretty long video. If you made it all the way to the end, um, you know, awesome. If you want to learn more about abolitionism, go to abolitionistrising.com. There we lay out all sorts of things that go into uh, more detail than what we were able to go into in this video. But hey, thank you for liking, subscribing, and watching and sharing videos on the channel. It really helps us out.